Using the ARP funding, the county has embarked on efforts to address the lack of affordable housing in our community, workforce development, changing public health needs, community first public safety, and racial equity and community engagement. The profound lack of affordable housing is the most significant challenge to growing prosperity in our region. A housing crisis has been building for years across Ramsey County and the Twin Cities metropolitan area and in many other regions across the nation. Our response to this crisis has two fronts, a proactive upstream approach to build new affordable housing and reduce the burden of housing costs on Ramsey County families, an immediate program to stabilize and provide long-term shelter spaces for people experiencing homelessness. Last year, we passed our new economic competitiveness and inclusion plan, which identified a shortage of more than 15,000 housing units across the county that are affordable for those in need. Subsequently, we passed Ramsey County's first countywide levy for affordable housing and economic development, which will provide 11 million per year to create and preserve affordable housing in Ramsey County. To kickstart this work in advance of the levy becoming operational, we're investing 20 million in 21 and 22 of ARP funds to immediately expand the supply of affordable housing. Finally, the county has a robust data portal that we're really excited about that shows the economic impacts COVID has on our residents in real time and how we're putting ARP funds to work. The portal reflects our goals, the progress towards those goals, the challenges and opportunities that we are experiencing in each of our programs. We believe we're one of the only municipalities across the country that has such a robust data collection and analysis. And we're happy to share that with you as well. <laughs> we believe the community served well by a public reporting process. Thank you again, Representative McCollum, for your leadership and for opportunity to share some of our story. While I would rather be joining you in person and talking about something other than our response to a global pandemic, I'm pleased to report that we're working hard to leverage these critical funds to create bold, transformative investments that will bring lasting change to our community. Thank you so much for your work in delivering this for our community. Next, we're going to hear from Mayor Carter. The city of St. Paul is receiving $172 million in the American Rescue Plan funding. And um, one of the things that uh, I know you're going to let us know is how that federal assistance enabled the city to meet its crisis. Your Honor. Over the course of the last couple of years, we have seen more Americans, more St. Paulites, more Minnesotans uh, homeless, uh, more unemployed, uh, more hungry. Uh, more uh, socially isolated and experiencing mental and physical health trauma than ever before in our lifetime. And those have always, of course, been the things that drive neighborhood safety challenges. The opportunity, it also came as part of that economic crisis. Uh, we found ourselves in a mode very swiftly uh, to say, we have to find new ways to help businesses. We have to find new ways to help families because so many people are struggling. Of the ARP resources that the city is set to receive, We've already received our first two of uh, uh, our first of two uh, eighty-three million dollar allocations to date. St. Paul, we've budgeted forty-five million of the initial eighty-three million we've received in ARPA funding. Uh, the forty-five million includes uh, investments to strengthen neighborhood safety, like supporting our city attorney office, city attorney's office's criminal division, uh, supporting a significant amount of police overtime. Uh, to ensure that our neighbors and residents can rely on the level of high quality police services that we've come to take for granted in St. Paul, um, uh, to, that we've come to rely on in St. Paul. Uh, we've built our Downtown Alliance Ambassador Program, which is those community members who are downtown uh, cleaning and helping uh, visitors find their way uh, and you know scrubbing off you know paint or anything, uh, graffiti and things like that to make sure that our downtown uh, is a clean and safe place for our visitors to go. Uh, we have experienced, as you know, uh, some very harrowing and challenging experiences downtown uh, and with outside of some very uh, unusual and extraordinary events. We saw this past summer, thanks to the big partnership that we've had between the city and the county and lots of other folks. We saw this summer local media reported that downtown crime was at a five-year low. Uh, that, of course, is fundamentally different than some of the challenges that other downtowns and some of our peer cities uh, have been facing as a result of some of these. Uh, we are advancing a radio replacement program to ensure that our uh, emergency responders have the ability to communicate with one another. 
and we're investing in some of our domestic abuse prevention programs in our community because we know that as we've seen this increase in violent crime, that one of the things that has driven, particularly the national increase in homicides, is uh, a shift uh, from gang-involved violence to domestic-involved violence as people were literally stuck in the house with one another. Council Member Knacker, I, I had the privilege, it was a much warmer day than it is today. Uh, maybe this is good, this is virtual. None of us had to get in a cold car, go back out into a cold car to do this. Uh, but it was a beautiful sunny day. It was a little brisk, but uh, we had our jackets on and we sat outside at Cake and Case in your ward after I had been visiting with uh, many of the businesses throughout the fourth district, but I was in your ward that day. And um, you were really working hard with the businesses on West 7th and throughout your ward on the challenges. Uh, and the city was providing help along with what we were doing in the Recovery Act. Could maybe you talk about how you've worked with, with the mayor, with the county, with, with others, with the Small Business Administration here federally to uh, help uh, to do better outreach for uh, our small business community? I'd be happy to, Congresswoman, but before I do that, I, I would be remiss if I didn't start by just, again, echoing my colleagues' thanks to you for this incredible opportunity to be here today and also the incredible opportunity represented by the American Rescue Plan. Um, I, I'm honored to be representing my colleagues on the City Council uh, who, who all wish to extend their thanks to you. Um, and just say, I, I, I think it's really important that you know that we recognize, as the mayor and as Chair Mattis Castillo said, that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and that we're fortunate to live in a time when leaders like you and President Biden and the federal government understands the importance of investing in our local communities. Um, and, and I want you to know that we also know that this comes with a responsibility uh, to make the most of the money and to spend it with, with urgency and with thoughtfulness so that we can make the most of it in the time that we have. Um, my council colleagues and I are committed to working very closely with the mayor's office, even, even more proactively than we do during a normal budget session to make sure that we fulfill that responsibility to determine in advance what our strategy is going to be. And so to make sure that as projects come in front of us at the council, um, we're all in alignment and we're approving them to get the dollars out the door. Um, there are a couple of values that the council has brought to this work um, in addition to the mayor's uh, statements, which he shared earlier about our specific funding priorities that I think are important. Um, first, and, and I think this session today really highlights your commitment to this too. We wanna be really transparent with the community about how we're spending these dollars. And that includes having that coherent strategy um, that we can communicate about in advance so that everyone understands what this historic investment means. And it doesn't appear that we're just making piecemeal investments here and there, but that it's all part of one coherent strategy. We also wanna make sure that we are working smarter, not harder. And sometimes that means enabling others in the community to do the work, such as many of our nonprofit partners. This is especially important in terms of the Office of Neighborhood Safety and our public safety investments and alternatives to policing. Um, there are lots of nonprofits out there that can do the work better than we can, and we want to make sure we give them the opportunity. Um, and we also know these are one-time dollars. So even though it's an incredible opportunity, it's, it's a time-limited opportunity. And so we want to make sure that either we're spending those one-time dollars on one-time uses, or that the uses that we spend them on have long benefits, so that the investment now pays off over the long run, even after the dollars are gone. Um, and then finally, I'm really glad that you asked the question about businesses, because uh, we recognize on the council, and I know the mayor does as well, that the pandemic is far from over and that businesses and nonprofits are still in need um, and, that, and that we need emergency relief to them to help them get through this pandemic. So to your point, um, I have been meeting with a number of business owners, including Keg and Case, um, including the Children's Museum and other small businesses and nonprofits um, that, have, that have brought up the fact that they either were not able to get some of the pots of, of federal and state dollars that were available earlier, and so they're in a unique a uniquely dire position, um, or just because they, they provide particular services to the community that have been impacted by the pandemic, for example, operating a large food market um, like Keg and Case or a children's museum uh, with communal play areas. So um, we, we are working very hard to figure out how to get those dollars out the door. I know our planning and economic development director, Nicole Goodman, and I spoke just last week about what that uh, emergency aid could look like. And we're talking to the mayor's office about that too. But to your point, I feel the sense of urgency and I know my colleagues do as well um, to make sure that our businesses can make it through this. Um, I wanna thank you again, um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, your honor, uh, council member uh, for your, your testimony. 
I want to thank you for your public service. I've been a council member. I've never been a mayor or a commissioner, uh, but I know the, the important work that a local government does uh, every single day. And um, I appreciate your willingness uh, always to involve our office so that we can do a better job in partnership. As I like to say, we each have our own lane and we wanna be traveling down that lane of traffic, um, working together, putting our blinkers on when we have to change lanes and work together and when we have to merge. And I couldn't ask for better partners uh, than the city of, of St. Paul and in Ramsey County. I wanna just point out that um, I am so proud of the uh, work that has been done between Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul. It truly has been a perfect example of working together in order to build back together. Uh, we know that we need to uh, work with people of all ages, all backgrounds, all skills, and to make sure that they feel secure in their lives and that they have an opportunity to make good paying jobs. I want to just let you know on one thing that we've been uh, uh, focused on, and that is uh, we know that uh, there's work to do. So the Treasury Department, listen very carefully to what uh, you have been saying, and I'm happy to report back that uh, the information that you provided has helped us in issuing the final rule for the COVID state and local recovery response fund. This rule is gonna take place in, in April, but thanks to your input, counties and cities can begin to take advantage of the new flexibilities and simplification to meet the immediate pandemic uh, needs and to promote long-term recovery. So our office stands ready to work with you as we you know, interpret through that and, and work through that. So we look forward to being a resource and a partner in you and doing what we need to do. But we have more work to do. Uh, we talked a lot about you know, how we've come back from the darkest days of the pandemic uh, with the American Rescue Plan. That was $8.5 billion just to Minnesota for vaccines and testing and small business and putting food on the table for so many children, helping people stay in their homes, help people get into safe shelter. You talked about a lot of that, but I just want to let you know that we're, we're focused on investing and rebuilding America's crumbling infrastructure. And that includes the $7 billion to Minnesota. And I know that there was talk about in some of that, the, the housing and some of the road and building transportation on that. But I'm excited about this bipartisan piece of legislation. It's gonna create millions of good paying jobs, union jobs in rebuilding America's infrastructure. And thirdly, we are continue to work to build back better for the future, to lower costs, to fight inflation and to strengthen uh, things for working, uh, working families. So together with a bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better Act, we will create a, a, an average of 2 million jobs over the next 10 years. Now, the Build Back Better is still a bit of a challenge for many of us to get that second phase for the human infrastructure done. As you know, we're facing um, obstruction from Republicans in the House, but mainly in the Senate from being able to meet the full needs of our community. And that included the loss of the child tax credit, uh, a lifeline for millions of our families here in Ramsey County. And it lifted so many families and children out of poverty. So you have my pledge that I will continue to work moving forward on all of this. We have some time remaining. So I have a, a couple of questions and this is, if you want staff to get back to us, this is a fact gathering um, opportunity for me. Uh, Mayor, um, I'm going to start with you. Um, how has the rollout process, uh, in your opinion, and when you talk to staff and with the council, how is the government recovery funds from the uh, from the Department of Treasury directly to you? You know, we did want uh, we have a great governor, Governor Walls. He was willing to, to 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 share the opportunity to build back better, but not all governors are Governor Walls. We wanted to make sure though, that there was no time lag in getting things directly to, to, to the cities. How's that been going? Congress member, thank you for the question. It's an important question. I'll tell you uh, in 2020, as we were at the beginning of all of this, uh, one of the frustrations and challenges that I had uh, was with a CARES Act uh, under a previous administration that was approved in a way that did not bring direct allocation to the city of St. Paul. We were large enough to be able to receive significant impacts and to incur significant costs associated with our response to the pandemic, but not large enough to receive a direct allocation. 
You're right. Not all governors are Governor Waltz, and we're very thankful for Governor Waltz's willingness and acknowledgement that the work that we do on the ground at the local level in cities is critical and is, and is important. Uh, we, of course, are thankful for, to be able to work in close partnership with the county, uh, who also understands the importance of cities and municipalities. But that was one of our biggest challenges uh, a year ago, uh, a year and a half ago, in addressing CARES Act dollars. It was first getting access to CARES Act dollars to being able to use it. The second piece is, uh, and it became something of a, uh, I'll date myself with a reference to the movie Brewster's Millions uh, with CARES Act dollars as we had uh, literally a matter of months uh, to spend and get rid of and be able to uh, allocate all of these resources that we needed to be able to allocate. Um, we're thankful for the resources. And of course, it's a challenge when trying to think about how in a two month stretch of time and a four month stretch of time uh, without the type of process that Council Member Naker just described, uh, engaging community members and being very thoughtful uh, to be able to leverage resources in the most effective means possible. I'm proud of the way that we ended up able to do that. Um, and I say all that to say is that one of the immediate differences that we saw uh, with the transition to a new administration was the advent of the American Rescue Plan Act in a way that created a more a, a longer term uh, scope uh, to be able to leverage and plan those resources and to be able to make sure that they're having the biggest impact possible in communities. Uh, uh, guidance uh, that is uh, significantly more flexible. And of course, the direct allocation uh, to a city like St. Paul is very, very important. We acknowledge and we're aware that we're all in the federal kind of staff, people who are building this uh, have had to build an entire enormous program. One of the most, uh, probably the most significant investment uh, in the American people uh, in certainly in our lifetimes. Uh, and that's required an enormous amount of work on their behalf. And I'll tell you, I'm amazed by the way that they have done stood this up. I'm amazed by the way our city staff and our county staff uh, has internalized and you know operationalized what the program requirements are and been able to leverage that towards uh, towards community benefits. We're fortunate in St. Paul that we've uh, had built our whole administration uh, at least for the past four years around this kind of public engagement to build these focuses. That's how we know when we get an infusion of resources like this that the focus areas are public safety, uh, affordable housing. Uh, and job creation, because that's what we hear from our residents year in and year out. So we're, we're sort of already on the starting line where that's concerned, that type of public engagement process to be able to be informed by our community where this is concerned. Um, but all of the investments, as you know well, all of the investments that we've described in this conversation today uh, have happened, not because uh, the, the political figures on this call have given speeches about it, but because we've had you know frontline staff at the federal level, at the county level, at the city, uh, working tirelessly day in and day out to ensure that we're able to move these investments forward. Uh, Council Member, um, I thank you for bringing up the nonprofits. Uh, we we are we are so blessed in Minnesota, but especially in the Metro Twin Cities metropolitan area, with the non nonprofits here. And at first, with the CARES Act, they were pretty much shut out. And I, along with a few other colleagues, made it made it loud and clear that we needed to support our our nonprofits. As uh, as we were supporting our non as our we were supporting our small businesses, they support small businesses. They su they support everything the county and the city uh, does. Uh, they they help our libraries. I mean, they're just so integral. Um, as we're looking forward to do I mean, uh, another, there's talk about doing more help for some of our small businesses, especially for some of our our, our arts venues. And we have quite a few here in the Twin Cities. We have a vibrant arts community. And nonprofit community. Is there anything that you would like to add or say more about the work that our nonprofits have been doing uh, during uh, during this crisis? Thanks, Congresswoman. And I um, I would just like to add that I, I think they have been doing yeoman's work and um, they're struggling. And I, I I think the there's a distinction without a difference when we're talking about businesses versus nonprofits in terms of being in need of help. Um, your tax status really doesn't determine either your impact on our community or the fact that you might be in need. Um, and, I, you know, our nonprofits have the secondary effects that you mentioned. Many of them have been, are the ones out on the front lines doing the work to help our community make it through this pandemic. Um, and, and they're also the ones doing some of that um, maybe less direct pandemic relief work, but something that has been very important in our community, especially downtown, which I represent, 
um, which is the, the people presence, um, something we've struggled with so much in our neighborhoods. Mayor Carter mentioned the public safety issues that we've been struggling with and that cities across the country have been dealing with. Part of that is just the fact that we don't have the eyes on the street. We don't have the foot traffic. We don't have the, the public safety that comes from a bustling downtown or bustling neighborhoods. Our nonprofits, our arts venues, our civic venues, as you're talking about, those are often the generators of that foot traffic and that people that people presence. So um, to me, the, the benefits of making sure that our nonprofits make it through and, and thrive beyond this um, go far beyond just ensuring that a particular nonprofit um, is successful. Madam Chair, I'm going to let you lead off with this question that um, others might want to add to it. And this is going to be the, 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 the last question um, that, that we'll have. So last month, it was it was huge. The city of St. Paul and Ramsey County pledged to pull their resource to, to invest. You know, I'm going to round it up, uh, $75 million in, a, in uh, AARP funding on new affordable housing. And that's one of the largest investments in affordable housing in the nation. So congratulations, you all. Aside from this historic investment, how do counties plan to address the homelessness crisis in the, in the fourth congressional district? And I know you have partners who are the city of uh, St. Paul. So uh, last question. Yeah, thank you so much, Congresswoman, for paying attention to this issue. You know, I didn't even know it was the biggest investment in the country. We were so focused at doing the right thing for our community. We didn't even pay attention to what others are doing, which really tells you that our partnership is about doing the right thing for people right here. And so we appreciate that. Um, you know, we are working side by side with the city of St. Paul, as well as our suburban communities, because homelessness is, is across our whole county, even though we see the greatest population in St. Paul. But collectively, we have an ask uh, to our, our state legislature. And actually, while we're on this call, Governor Walls and uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan just announced a historic investment in homelessness services uh, just, just moments ago as well in partnership. But we're working together to really say, how do we go beyond this investment that we've had during the COVID response because we found a model that is actually working, as I said earlier, for people to stabilize. As we go down upstream and do this historic investment on building affordable housing at the 30% AMI, which is our greatest need uh, in Ramsey County, those projects will probably take three to five years in reality to get them built and get families moved in. And so we're working together to, to secure additional funding so that we can maintain the shelter system that we have now that's working until we can move families into permanent housing. And I think that's incredibly important, especially as we're stabilizing families, stabilizing individuals with supportive services and come and wrapping around to help them get to where they need and all the things they need in order to get that permanent housing to include jobs, to include uh, healthcare and, and other resources. Uh, in addition to that, we also have um, identified a group of people who have experienced homelessness over a long time uh, that's called our Familiar Faces Program, together with the City of St. Paul and our court system, that we have a small number of folks that, that require so many resources that just need a, a little bit more help and, and dedicated resources to keep them out of in and out of bouncing of a shelter or the criminal justice system or the court system. And so we are asking for funding so that we can put caseworkers specifically tailored to those with the highest greatest of need as well. Well, thank you. Any anybody want to add to add to that? I think she did a great job, and everybody was nodding their head yes. So I want to thank you for your testimony for taking time out uh, for today.